Hello all, Andy here, helping you build a career you love. Happy Thursday, or happy Tuesday, or happy any day of the week you're watching this. Love getting together with you every week, helping you build a career you love, because I believe everybody who works should be able to get up every morning and go to a job they love in a career they love. That's what it's all about. Today, we're going to be talking about job descriptions, but not really just about job descriptions and how to look at them and interpret them. I want to talk with you about if you have a job description, how do you chop it up, dissect it, look at it so you know what needs to go in your resume so that you can actually get the job interview. Once you get that job interview, how do you look at the job description to know which interview stories are going to carry the day, which ones are going to set you apart, what you need to include in them, and and because, what do I always tell you, we're playing chess, not checkers. I know if I get that job interview, I'm actually going to get a job offer. And when I do, what information do I need to make an argument about what I'm worth? So we're gonna we're also gonna talk to you about how to foresee what goes into the salary negotiation so that when you get that offer and you say check, you can turn around and quickly say checkmate. So that's what today's all about. Get in the chat, say hi. Let me know where you're watching from. I always love that. Put some question marks in front of your questions so Kara can find them because we are gonna do a nice QA. After this, like we do every week, you know before I get into the teaching, I always love to say hi. Bold Eagle, whoever you are, you are welcome for what I know is going to be an amazing show. Marianne Palermo, you know I serve it up right when you need it. Great to have you. Andy, Reka, Donna, Kiru, oil and gas job hunting. I'm assuming you're an energy guy, as was I for a decade. Victor, what's up? Sebastian, good to see you, my Argentinian friend. Tanya. Sweat lit. Oh, Sarah, that's Sarah. Great to see you the other day. Literally see you and everybody else. Okay. I'm looking at green lights. So let's get rolling. Job descriptions. All right. First thing is I'm going to walk you through how I look at a job description. We're not talking about keywords here. That's remedial stuff. And you're my people. And we don't do remedial in this, in this show because you deserve more. So I'm going to actually pull up a job description. I'm going to tell you where I got it from. Uh, and if you like what we go through today, I'm actually meeting with members of my job search coaching program tomorrow to run through a bunch of these. And so I asked them about a week ago if they would send me their job descriptions. So I got about, I don't know, 70 or 80 of these that I looked through from people who were either interviewing for these jobs or interviewed for these jobs or wanted to apply for these jobs. And Mark, Mark P, hopefully you're here, Mark, because this is for you, uh, gave me one that was a director of PMO for a technology consultancy. And I love that this has widespread application. So we're going to review this and I'm going to pull this up here in a minute. So let's, let's get right to it. If you are in my job search coaching program, I actually sent you an email yesterday to download this document and what you're seeing it's just a simple word document that i made a pdf on you might see some white space like this where i cut out uh names of the companies and some other things that i don't think were as germane now one of the things that i want you to see as we go through this is i made a little legend because i put some markings to make it really visible for you as to things that i wanted to i wanted to point out now if you see something in yellow, I'm, I'm drawing your attention to something that, based in the job description, I actually think is relatively neutral, meaning every job candidate that they're talking to is going to have this, and it's common. It's easy experience to find. So you're not really going to separate yourself as a result of the yellows. Then there's some greens. Greens give you an opportunity to separate yourself because they're likely talking to some candidates who may not have the green. And then the blue, the electric blue, I guess that is, this is where the interview is won. Okay, so so I hope, I hope that's pretty clear. It's not too tough to follow along. Uh, don't worry about all the text and the copy because this will stay up on YouTube and you can pause me or slow me down or whatever till your heart's content. But I did want to walk through it this way because I went. I did want to give these little booklets to my boot campers and I thought it was an easier way to illustrate this. So, okay, so this organization, as I mentioned, is a is a technology consultancy. It's a mark and a marketing consultancy firm, but basically they're a digital firm. This is for a director of program management office. And if you're not entirely sure on what that is, 
think in terms of project managers who, who run projects. They could be IT projects. They could be construction projects. In this case, these are consultancy projects. And the program manager manages a portfolio of projects. So likely has project managers that report to him or her. And that person's job is to ensure that there is a structure in place, a methodology in place, an operating model in place to manage each of the different projects that theoretically should be contributing to a common goal or a common program. So this is kind of like a portfolio manager of projects, and they usually manage project managers who then manage people on the projects that run the projects, the business analysts, uh, the, the team leaders, the functional analysts, the technology analysts, the tech team, the quality assurance team, whatever it is that is being implemented. Now, this says fastest. I highlighted that in yellow. All that means is the company's growing. So you're likely going to be operating in a reasonably fast-paced environment, just something of note, because that might come up. I don't think it's a big deal, but it's worth pointing out. It's technology, personal touch of the boutique firm. So they say personal touch, but we also support organizations of large and small sizes, various sizes. I would file this away just in the event that they ask you if you've managed large projects. You're likely going, if you've managed large portfolios or large projects, it's going to be a lot easier to manage the small projects. But the personal touch has to do with making each client or each customer feel as though they're unique and special. So there is a, an element of openness, welcomeness, interaction, and other things that you're going to need to portray and demonstrate in the interview that, that come along with you, traits that come along with you. Now, the business intelligence, web design, creative, and infrastructure, the reason that that's green is because... This job can be done by someone who does not have that expertise. Should you have that expertise in particular where you're a program manager and you've implemented or run projects that are business intelligence related or web design or user interface related, you're, you're, you're going to have the domain expertise that's going to be a plus. You're not going to win the job because of this, but it will give you an opportunity or a leg up on other uh, job candidates that don't necessarily have that because I, in viewing this, not to mention recruiting for, I don't know, about a thousand of these people, have never seen that to be a true requirement or indicator of success. So I'm I'm willing to overlook that if a candidate doesn't have it. They're likely going to be in my recruitment process if they've got a lot of the other areas of expertise that I'm looking for. Customer sat. This is going to come up you're going to need to demonstrate your customer satisfaction, customer service skills, but to the extent that you have opportunities that you can share where you did something that substantially increased customer satisfaction, I think that's going to play to your favor. I consider it a neutral. You could turn it into a separator if you try. Now, you're going to manage project management teams. Whoever this organization is interviewing is going to have managed project managers before. If you have not managed project managers before or managed a portfolio of projects, I probably wouldn't even bother to talk to you. Not because I don't think you can do it, but because I know I'm going to easily be able to find somebody who already has that experience. This is a, these are common skills. These are not difficult to find skills. So I don't view that as a, as a separator in this case. Now, when we start to get into you know process policies and all this other good stuff, that's all fine and good. But here's where we start to get into some of the teal stuff. This thing about aligning to company strategies and mission. Now, for those of you that are in my programs or those of you that come to the Thursday live shows, you know I make fun of these kind of words usually. They don't say a whole lot. They don't mean a whole lot. They're kind of esoteric, and they don't, they don't really stand for much. This is one of the exceptions because if you are a program manager who has worked on strategy, understands corporate and business strategy, growth strategies, or whatever it might be, this is where you're actually going to win the job. I'll talk specifically about how you do that here in a few minutes, but I want you to know, this this teal color right here, this electric blue, that's where you're going to win the job. I'm going to hire the person that most closely aligns to this. 
and I'll get really specific about what that is. And then the next element here that I want you to take note of is this selecting and implementing and improving PMO tools. That in and of itself, most of the individuals that I'm going to be interviewing are going to have those abilities. But if you have, have implemented from scratch an entire governance structure that includes this, it's also going to be where the job is won because I'm going to get a lot of program managers that haven't actually implemented the governance st structure from scratch with the tools and the assets that all the project managers for working on all the clients or even internally, whether you're doing this internally or externally, are going to have. Okay, who's who's tracking with me so far? Are you... Is this e fairly easy so far to understand? Give me a hey in the chat. I just want to make sure as I sip my delicious tea here that you guys are tracking. Give me a I'm tracking in the, in the chat. All right, next couple of things. Next couple of things here. Uh, actually, wait, let me, let me put this up here. Great. Uh, next couple of things. The partner, partnering with different divisions... Partnering with different divisions may sound pretty innocuous, except that if you are the kind of person that's running the portfolio and running the programs, you're dealing with a lot of business leaders. Uh, you could be dealing with other partners that are vendors that are contributing to your programs as well. But the person who actually is able to influence the leaders to whom they're either serving or working with is going to win the job from me because I need somebody that can lead the charge. So it's not, to me, it's less important how effective you are at managing the project managers. Those are pretty easy skills. But the ones who can actually influence the people that they're supporting, that to me is going to be more of a rare individual. Having that consultative nature where you can make an argument that's so persuasive that you could get a business leader to open up their pocketbook or see things the way you want them to see it. That, to me, is a winner right there. The governance structure, that's going to be important. A lot of people that are interviewing for this role are going to have governance in their background. But again, I want to go back to the part about creating it from scratch. And we'll get to some of the details here in a minute. And then a few of the other things, creating statuses and summaries, being able to hire, all of that stuff grows on trees as far as I'm concerned. And, and delivery grows on trees. Now, delivery, sales, and marketing. If you are familiar with these domains, this is a marketing boutique firm. So I actually don't need those skills, but if you have those skills and you have the domain expertise, I'm going to favor you, right? That you understand selling concepts, marketing concepts, delivery concepts. So that, that to me is important. Now, the funny thing is the requirements in this entire section, they basically said nothing. That's why you don't see anything highlighted. The rest of this stuff is... Uh, is actually um, you know, pretty uneventful. The one thing that they didn't include was the salary, and uh, it's difficult to tell how wide a range this is, but I'm not really concerned by that at the moment. Now, I want to talk for a second about if I was going to think about what was going to go into my resume that was going to ensure that I got an interview for this role is... I think in terms of I think in terms of uh, of eight major goals or accomplishments that employers care about. And I don't know if you saw my LinkedIn talk last week or basically any other talk I've ever said. <laughs> this always comes up in, in some way, shape, or form is I'm thinking about what is it that I need to bubble up to the top, top of my resume, top of my discussions. Everything, the dialogue should center around how I help organizations achieve these great eight goals. If you're not familiar with these, basically, you're trying to help them increase their revenue, improve their market awareness, their customer attraction, their customer service, their corporate growth, right? Things like this, cost reduction, process efficiency, employee happiness. These are, these are major goals. So if I'm the program manager... I want to make sure that the right great eight goals get bubbled up to the top, and now I, I can align them to what's in this job description. So if I had to pick the three most important 
areas I would want to highlight on my resume right up at the top. These would be highlights numbers one, two, and three. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, for those of you that don't go to the Andy School of Resume Writing, up at the top, there's a career summary, or a, I call it the career profile. It's an aggregation of all of your accomplishments. The next section is your resume highlights or your career highlights, which are not your most important accomplishments. These are not about you. These are enticers to show somebody else major, major impacts that you've made that they would be interested in hiring you because of, right? You may, you may have accolades that you're super proud of, but if they're not the ones I care about, you lose, your resume loses potency, your marketability goes down. So what are the three that I would choose if I was the program manager? Let's talk about that to ensure that I could actually get that I could actually get the interview. Now, if you are in my job search coaching program, I have linked you here to the direct premium video or videos where you can figure this out. I give you nauseating detail as to how to go through this selection process. For those of you that are in the free domain, I'm going to just simply run through which ones I think are the most important and why. Client sat. This here is that you've run a program, run a program that has had major benefit to a client. It will preferably have multiple projects, not just a single project, and it will hit one of the big problems. I implemented a program where the best and most ideal in this case is a selling, marketing, or delivery, as they called for in the job description, portfolio. In the absence of that, pick something else that, that attributed to one of the grade eight. It is a singular singular initiative or a portfolio of initiatives that addressed one major business aspect. Okay, that's that's one. Number two, that goes to customer satisfaction, revenue, could be revenue generation, could be a number of those. Number two is infrastructure. I want the person who's built an entire methodology from scratch that includes efficient delivery of programs and projects, and also sets up analytical dashboards and other things of that nature. And, and the silver bullet is you created the entire governance strategy from scratch. Meaning I walked into an organization, they didn't have a governance process. They just ran projects, they were hip shooters or whatever you want to call it. But I created it from scratch. This goes to methods, practices, process efficiency, the delivery and the on time, the ability to develop a proposal on time or an accelerated pace increases win rates, helps generate revenue. The delivery of the projects go more efficiently. You don't have overruns. You're cost effective. You deliver on time, which also improves customer happiness. There's so many benefits that are addressed in developing infrastructure that's used on an ongoing basis. Not to mention, but I will, the fact that this is a gift that keeps on giving because all of those goals and accomplishments are done in perpetuity. Every single time your company does that, you're reaping the benefits of the efficiency you built one time. Okay, so that's number two. And then number three, I want the person, I want the person who actually can influence decision making. By the way, the bullet highlight is not leadership and influence. That's the topic. You're always writing your bullet in terms of the goals that you're addressing. But what you're what I want to see is did you build something, do something? that changed the course of nature, right? I built an executive dashboard from the analytics that we gathered from either what the program was doing or on behalf of the program that enabled the leaders to see what I needed them to see faster, more effectively, more clearly to make better business decisions that resulted in some of the great eight benefits. Okay, that's the third bullet. All right, so now in my resume, if I've got bullets related to that or some variation of those are the ones I'm tackling. So far, so good. Do you see? Do you see why we want these? Now, in general, if you're running projects or you're running programs or you're running operations, okay, any of you that are doing any of those, this these apply. But these especially apply to this particular job description. Okay, now let's get into, well, all right, I want to win the interview. I want you to look at a couple of things here and we'll kind of break this down. But when I, when, I, when I think about the interview story 
that everybody's going to tell, everybody's going to have some program that they managed. Yawn. I mean, it's practically coma-inducing. Okay, so I know that everybody in the interviewing process and any of the candidates that I talk to, if I'm recruiting for this, are going to have those skills. Okay, so you are totally, totally neutral if you tell me about a project that went well. Do you get that? There's nothing exciting about a program that went well. I would expect that you're going to tell me that. I would have expected that from your resume. So right now, you haven't, you haven't done anything for me yet. You haven't changed my initial inclination about you. All right? So everybody's going to be able to do that. So all of you, momentary point of reflection here. How many of you thought, Andy, I didn't get the job. Why? I was perfect for the job. Because you told an efficient story about how you did something effectively that's the same as anybody else could tell. You get, you get what I'm saying, right? Just because you were a perfect match doesn't mean you were the best match, right? In your mind, you were a perfect match because you checked a bunch of boxes off. That doesn't make you my best match, okay? All right, so now, what makes you the best match? This one right here. You built a PMO that was in alignment with a corporate strategy that you tied it back to or participated in based on ROI, payback periods, compounding benefits of sequencing your projects, and so on and so forth. All right, let me tell you about Alex. So y'all are here, right? Andy, I'm here. I want the job one step up. I want the responsibilities one step up. And Andy, you know damn well I want the pay that goes one or two steps up, right? Right? You guys get this, right? Okay. So I work with this woman, Alex, and she's awesome, and she's a program manager. And she's run projects at big telecommunications companies. She's run projects at big insurance companies. And she's done a bunch of other awesome stuff. She's just basically awesome. And she emails me and says, Annie, we need a, I need a session. Uh, I've got this opportunity with this financial company. And a, an executive recruiter contacted me. I really want to go in and impress them. And I, this is, sounds kind of cool. And it was kind of cool. Because this is a situation where there was a CIO. There was a contractor that the CIO had a longstanding relationship with. It's two women that were running the IT department. And the IT department had some older technologies. They had 200 project managers running IT projects. I want you to imagine, that's a lot of projects. Now, Alex is what I would say, a, a, like a mid-senior person, not uber, uber senior, probably make somewhere in the mid to high 100s in, in salary at this time, had run projects efficiently at this time, and wanted some help. So we were getting ready to prepare for the interview, and I said to her, okay, let's work on the base story. So for those of you that have had interview coaching with me, you know there is a story that carries the day. It's the story you're going to use for most of the interview, probably for all of the interviews. You don't need many stories. You need one major story that aligns to what they need you to do. You want to demonstrate that you've done it, but you really want to get them talking about how you're going to do it in the future. And this was about how they were going to set up their PMO. So I said to her, okay, pick your, pick your money story. And I want you to tell me, just tell me the story like you would tell me. Let's see what we're working with. Let's give this a start. So Alex, in orderly fashion, starts telling me how to build a PMO. And step one, and step two, and step three. And about 30 seconds into this, I was like, eh, okay, let's stop the story right there. No story ever starts with, an efficient way of how you built anything you built that goes for all of you. So I said, Alex, you are, you're here and you're, you're telling them how you're going to build an efficient PMO. Do you want to tell them how to build an efficient PMO or do you want to get hired? Right kind of thing. This is not about how you do what you do. This is about how you tell a story about what you're going to do, but you also need to know where the story starts and which, which story to tell them. So I said, when you get into the process, you need to make what you're about to say and all the details matter of fact, like any idiot can do this, right? Anybody that goes and gets the PMP handbook can tell you how to set up a project or how to run a PMO or how to do any of this. Anybody can do that. 
anybody, even if you don't have the experience, you can do that. Right. So what you need to explain to them is how they need to think and how they need to create a successful PMO that's going to help them achieve their business goals. So you don't start the story where they ask the question. And none of you do not confuse the way you answer questions with what question was being asked. You are answering questions with what information they need to sell you best. Okay, so you don't start the story with this is how I build a PMO. You'll get to that. You start the story with the best PMOs are the ones that are set up as a result of the corporate strategy. You have to look at the corporate strategy. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your biggest goals that are gener going to generate you the most money, that are going to that are going to save you the most money, or that are going to reduce your risk or any exposure that you have? That's it. That's all I care about. Tell me what those are. Tell me what your initiatives are. Do not walk into employers. I'm telling you all. Just because they tell you you they have a problem, how would you solve it? You need to get to the spot where this is what you need to do, so you never had the problem in the first place, or this is where you need to get so that when I set the PMO up, which I could do in my sleep and I'm going to give you all the steps to to help you be assured that I can do that the reason you can sleep well at night is because I'm going to set you up a structure that's going to get you what you need at the top level not at the mid level I anybody can do that anybody can give you the steps so what are the goals what do we need to what do we need to address I'm going to optimize the, the and prioritize the projects based on data of what you're going to get as a result of implementing this first, this second, and so on. And yes, we're going to take the synergy. And yes, I'm going to make sure that it's optimized from a resource standpoint. And yes, we're going to sequence things in terms of what makes sense. But if it doesn't tie back to ultimately what the business needs, the PMO is ineffective, even if it's well run. The story has to start there. So you need to step back and make sure that if you're going to tell them how you're going to do something, that you elevate it to their strategy. What is it that we need to accomplish? Don't ask me how I'm going to put this together. I'll tell you how I'm going to put this together based on what you need it to do. That immediately elevates you because no one's going to start there. And no one's going to no one's going to think to step back and answer the question that they actually need answered. They're going to answer the question that was asked, which was poorly designed and not a great indication of who the actual best candidate is. And I don't even care who the best candidate is. I care that you get the job so that, you know, and she'd never done that before. And it didn't even matter because all she needed to do was say that. And she did. And guess what? Instead of making 160, she makes 240. Right. Because because all of a sudden I don't. I, I can I can find 10 people who can do this. She's the only one that said this. Now, this makes sense to me. Right. It only makes sense after after somebody says it. So when you want to look at this goes for any of you interviewing for any role. Step up. What's the step up? part of the conversation that needs to occur. So so that's the thing, that's the thing that's actually going to win the day. So she tells this story and she got the job as you can imagine. Now let's run through this just for completeness sake. Your stories that you're going to tell in the interview, they need to include these components. Now, uh, if you have a story fortunate enough that includes all of these, you're golden. If you're not, if you don't, then if you're in my premium coaching and my job search coaching program, I've taught you how to Frankenstein stories and fracture stories in order to include components that help you check the boxes that you need to check in order to show them that you have everything that you need to have, even if it's not in the one story you want to tell them. But I tell you how to conflate this stuff to make it sound like a singular event. Anyway, just for purposes of illustration here. You, you, if you can choose a solution that is BI related or, or sales or marketing related or BI slash sales and marketing related, that's gold. If it's bigger, it's better, right? Even though we work with clients of all sizes, by default, if you can work with a big one, you can work with a small one. The reverse is not true. So I would rather you pick a bigger one than a smaller one. Any project that requires you to actually implement the governance for the very first time is going to win. That's going to carry the day because most project manager or pro most program managers will have implemented methodologies that were already in existence. If you were the one that needed to pioneer it, that's going to that's going to give you a leg up. This goes back to the electric blue stuff that I was pointing to earlier. When I set up here, the one that's going to carry the day is when you align to strategy 
here and the tools in and of themselves were pioneered. I think I, I think that was, oh, maybe that was in a different job description. But basically, I'm looking for the pioneer who can align this to the strategy and has built all of it. Support of the business leaders. So where I convinced these individuals to go with my recommendations or to expand and open their pocketbook because it made financial sense for them to accelerate or even decelerate scope or whatever it was that you talked them into because you're a fast-talking Svengali kind of thing. Uh, management of project managers, you got to have the fact that you've managed people. A half a dozen would be nice. They probably manage 50 people each and so on and so forth. And then you want cost-effective delivery or portfolio adherence to the budget. Right, so these are the kind of things you really want to look at from a, oop, from a, sorry about that, from a uh, inventory of what needs to go into the stories. Okay, we tracking so far? Tracking so, wait, you know what? If you are loving this, wait, we can even done, man, I haven't even got to the money part yet. If you're loving this, give me a thumbs up, give me a, give me a, that means click the like button, so, and share this, people need help. People need help. It's December. They're going to the holidays. We want them feeling good. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Robert Clark. Okay, so now, what do I always tell you? Why do people fail? Because they didn't plan to succeed. If I get an interview, I'm telling you this. If you get an interview, you should get the job. You should, period, hard stop. If I get an interview, I'm getting the job. When I get the job offer, what is it that I need to know in order to A, make a good decision, that's for another day, but B, what am I going to argue about why I'm worth more? Not only am I the right person, but you need to pay me more. And so I've also taught you before how to keep a diary along the way. In order to keep a diary that's effective, you need to know what to include in the diary. In order to know what to include in the diary, you need to look at the job description to make sure you know what's important to them. And you're collecting data along the way from this is what they're going to need me to do. By the way, that can change from the time you start the process to the time you finish. The scope of your role can change. It might go up, might go down, right? Kind of thing. You're going to talk to people along the way that are going to work with you. How are you going to support them? You're going to talk to people along the way that might be on your team. Other program managers, what do I have that they don't have? Right, You got to be thinking, right? This is chess, not checkers. So in order for you not to be flat-footed at the time you get the job offer or the time they say, hey, Andy, what, what do you want? What's it going to take? What's your, you know, you wouldn't tell us your expected salary. What do you want now, right? What are you going to do when you get right up to the table? Now, let's talk about that. So those folks that are in my Job search coaching program, you know we talk about the grid, okay? You create the grid, and the grid is a way for you to, cre to create a visual that shows your value in alignment with what it is they want you to accomplish to the extent you're going to do that, why they need to pay you more, but it also gets congruence and agreement on what it is that you're going to do and how success is going to be measured and what success, your success, is going to mean to them. Okay. Now, if you're in my job search coaching program, uh, we just did the salary negotiation workshop hot off the press like a week or two ago. There's a video in there called Preparing for Your Negotiation, Identifying Your Value and Questions. Or if you're watching in the main boot camp product, there's an older version, similar, similar teaching, called Salary Negotiation Tactics with Role Definition. This, what I'm about to give you, is a is are some components you are going to want to include in your role definition because these are going to be the key indicators of where the money's going to come from, why they're going to want to pay you more. So the first one is building of the infrastructure. Now, they might have an existing infrastructure of governance and PMO methodology and project management methodology and everything from steering committees to status meetings to whatever. You're either going to build it from scratch or you're going to improve what they have. And when you improve what they have or build it from scratch, you're going to attach efficiencies to the delivery of the projects. Now, this particular PMO role happens to be a consultancy, which means I'm going to create the pro forma templates 
for every project that we create that's of a particular kind, whether it's strategy, whether it's implementation, whether it's whatever, remediation or whatever, we're going to be able to put our proposals together faster. That's going to take less time. We're going to be able to deliver it faster. That's going to save money. It might be able to create more profit or create lower price tags that'll make it more attractive, but still high value for our customers. We're going to make sure that we don't have overruns, which are going to keep our costs as a company from an operating expense down and so on and so forth. This is one element to that. There could be project efficiency. There could actually be efficiencies gained in each of the projects that you're going to be running for which you've created this new methodology, this improved methodology, and so on. Not to mention, it could be from a visibility standpoint where you're creating dashboards and other things. Do not assume that this is in place. This is the stuff you need to gather, but this is where you're going to make more money because I'm going to pay more money for somebody who I'm confident can actually build me all of this or review and fix all of this as opposed to somebody who's just a program manager, right? And then you've got a lot of you project managers thinking, well, Andy, I can step up into that. You can, but I'm hiring the person who actually can build me all this other stuff. Now, am I worried about you being able to handle a portfolio? That's one worry, but I, it's not even a thought that you can build me all the infrastructure. This is why you wonder why, can I just step up? Maybe, but if you're competing against me, I'm gonna go after this kind of thing. Okay, tool identification could be another area. Some of this can be conflated. Some of this could be separated. These are just ideas in the event that you discover in this role that they have some or they don't have some. I am identifying every damn tool that they do not have that I'm going to build. And when I come to the negotiating table, I'm going to say, I'm going to build you these 12 tools that you need that you don't have. You need to pay me for that. It's not just my job to manage portfolios. Okay, this is what separates the person who gets paid 160 from the person who gets paid 240. Okay, customer sat. Where are we? What's our benchmark? Oh, we don't even have a customer satisfaction process where we're evaluating our teams every quarter. We're checking in with our customers. I'll put that in place. Okay. Uh, we'll also benchmark it and then I'm going to and then I'm going to improve it. We're going to go in the first day on the job. I'm going to give you a form that all our project managers have to ask all of our clients. I want it filled out immediately. Then in six months, we're going to take it again, and you're going to give me a bonus based on how much I improve it. I'm not asking you to give me the money. I'm asking you to earn. I'm asking, I want to earn it, but you're going to attach that to my bonus kind of thing. What about political capital and relationships with business unit leaders? I am definitely assessing where this particular IT department or whatever fits with the business leaders. Are we loved? Are we listened to? Are we not? I will get us listened to kind of thing, right? And then employee management. So this just gives you an idea of some of the biggies. All of these are affiliated with the great eight. But when you go to a negotiating table, if you're going to tell me, Andy, you need to pay me more because... The market, I'm a, you know what, when the market goes down, I'm taking your money away. Is that going to be your argument? No. Let's go back to Alex. I said to her, Alex, you're telling them how to put steps together in a PMO. You don't pay the pump plumber to bang on the pipes, right? You pay the plumber because the plumber knows where to bang. Right. If you want to talk to me about PVC pipes and valves and fittings, I can undo my, underneath my kitchen sink by myself, and I don't know anything about plumbing. Right. It's a bunch of twists and turns. Right. I need you to know that the backup is here in the house, and that's where we need to go. Kind of thing. When you're telling your stories, are you talking about banging on pipes? Are you talking about where to bang? So when you get to the negotiating table, what are they paying you for? Right. Paying you to do this job, I'll just pay you the 160 kind of thing. You're going to do all this other stuff? I'm happy to pay a lot more because the other 80K is peanuts compared to what I'm going to get in terms of cost efficiency, accelerated proposal development, wins, increased wins, employee happiness, political capital that we don't have, and so on and so forth. So I want you to think about it. When you look at a job description, I want you to take a step back 
think, what's my resume need to look like? What are the most important elements that I need to highlight? Not what are the most important things I've ever done in my life or what am I most proud of? I don't care about any of that. I care about the ones that match what the employer needs. When you get into the interviewing process, think in terms of what's the story that's going to elevate me above all the other candidates. And, and just so you know, if you say, well, Andy, that example you used with Alex about the strategy, I haven't done that before. She didn't either. You just need to know what that is and start having a dialogue, having a dialogue around this. Okay. And then when you get to the negotiating table, you should have been accumulating all this data along the way so that when you think about what are they going to pay for, they're not paying you to bang on the pipes. Remember, they're, they're paying you to know where to bang. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, this, oh, 40 minutes, I'm living right. This will live up on YouTube. You can you can come back to this if you like this. I'm doing more of these tomorrow. We're going into HR. We're going into marketing. Uh, we well, got another account management sales one. We got some holiday stuff we're going to be talking about. We got some Q and A we're going to be doing. And so um, if you're if you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week. If you're here with me live, we're going to the chat.